feelings and intentions of people, we have little, uh, we have learned little. And I think it is in that respect that McGarren is, clo is close to Proust. Uh, he also reminded us that we, we can't understand what it is to be Irish Western, our part of a global society, unless we focus on the local. Uh, the universal, as he said, is the local, but with the walls taken away. So I came to live in McGarren land five years ago, and it has been quite, um, and it's, for me, it's been like a slow walk into a lake of meaning. Um, enveloped in beauty. Um, there's, a, there's a sense of being, a sense of eternity that I did not get in the city. Um, I am part of that environment, um, of an environment that, that resonates uh, with a sense of never having been mastered and controlled. And if you're here in winter and the howling rain is beating down on you, you know, uh, that there is no mastery and control of nature. But there is a sense of sacred. Um, I feel I'm part of some, some whole uh, that I don't understand. Uh, I, I get a glimpse, um, uh, the, the, and these glimpses become small epiphanies, um, small cracks through which I get a feeling of belonging to something wonderful and mysterious. It's something for me beyond reason. It's something into which I dissolve. Um, I'm no longer a Catholic. I have little time for the institutional church. I read about it, I follow it, and I follow the antics and the machinations. Um, but it means nothing to me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm often dismayed and, and indeed disgusted by its power, its pomp and arrogance. I'm angry about the it's claimed to be the one true church, and any time that, that seems to be coming through, I wince when it proclaims that it knows for certain what God thinks. Um, when I am out and about dissolving into McGarren land, I often wonder about the, the nature of God, and I wonder, does God think? And if he does think, is he, she, it, and dare I say they, reasonable? Um, and yet, like McGarren, I can't help but be Catholic. It's in my blood. And this is, again, going back to what Eamon uh, was saying uh, following uh, 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 John Broderick. It's part and parcel of who I am, how I think, feel and act. Uh, it's an overcoat that I wore growing up, whose molecules have infiltrated my being, the very sense of who I am. Unlike McGarren, I get little sense of awe, ecstasy or comfort from Catholic rituals. Sometimes when I go into a church, I get a sense of nostalgia and remember those May days of devotion with the altar festooned with flowers, the incense rising and singing hymns to Mary. For a long time, I thought I was not religious, that once I was no longer a Catholic, I was no longer religious. Such was the power of the church it persuaded me that there was no religion, no salvation outside of the church. If I turned my back on the church and the truth that it had revealed to me, I was damned for all eternity. I no longer think that way. I now think that I am as religious as the next man or woman. It's just that I don't belong to any institutional religion. I believe there is a truth about the meaning of life and what it is to live a good life in the Bible, in the Gospels, and the life of Jesus. But I also believe that there are insights to be gained from the writings of McGarren. I never met the man, but he has become a kind of soulmate. So then let me generalize from the particular, or rather the person. I, uh, I don't think I'm alone. I think that I am like many others brought up as Catholics in Ireland. I became very good at religion at being devout and obedient, of engaging in the rituals, following the teachings, rules and regulations of the church. But because everything was handed to me on a plate, I became religiously lazy. So what's the argument? I spent most of my life trying to understand how I came, I've come to be the way I am. I realized quite early that there are that any difference there are 
is in, in the way I see and understand the world and my sense of self um, and the way I relate to others uh, came not just from being Catholic, but from growing up at a time when the church was so powerful. That the power related not just to its institutional influence, but the way it ingrained itself into people's hearts, minds, and bodies. The question then was, why and how did it become so powerful? And I think that this is something that you know, is, is, needs to be at the center, that it, it came out with the commission reports, this need to reflect as to how did things happen the way they did. Um, uh, and I think it's not a question that's asked enough and, 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 and sincerely and deeply, because it's rare for those in power to critically reflect about the nature of their power, its origins and how it's created and maintained. Um, I think it's something that the institutional church fails to do continually. It has come to haunt it, particularly in relation to cler clerical child sex abuse and other scandals. For many different reasons, many related to a struggle for controlling ownership of the land, the drive for political independence, the desire to become civilized, and an interest in developing a culture that was different from their colonial masters, Irish Catholics from the beginning of the 19th century, but especially after the famine, began to willingly comply to the dictates and demands of the Catholic Church, which was increasingly being dominated by Rome. And this is, goes back to um, Mark Hedeman's point about there's two carriages before we get to the engine. Um, uh, the Irish carriage and the, 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 the Roman carriage. And the devotional revolution that took place in the latter half of the 19th century had the effect of bringing ways of being religious inside churches and under the control of priests. They provided a sense of awe and ecstasy that was central to creating and maintaining a sense of bonding and belonging. And they also provide them the means of living a good life and attaining salvation. Slowly but surely, Church gained a monopoly over morality and spirituality, and it's more la more laterally have I, I've concentrated on the on the spirituality side of this monopoly. Um, it, it sifted through the popular magical devotional practices that existed, sometimes incorporating and adapting them, sometimes quietly eliminating them. Soon, the bishops, priests, nuns, and brothers were all singing from the same hymn sheet. And the, and the laity happily sang along with them. So to go again, to go back to Mark Hedeman, that difference was systematically eliminated and we got a legal orthodox institutional church. And the result of that was the variety of religious experiences diminished. There was a time and place to have religious experiences and every religious experience should be in its proper time and place, which preferably was in the church. There were outbreaks of mysticism that had to be blessed by the church, but these, sorry, but these, these outbreaks had to be blessed by the church. Now, mysticism is an important part of religion, but as the, the church authorities were, knew well, the problem with, uh, the, Joe Dunn used to say this to me, the problem, Tom, with mysticism is it begins in mist and ends in schism. Um, so the success of the Catholic church monopoly over spirituality was the way that it dealt, for example, with Knock, the charismatic renewal, moving statues, and more recently, the House of Prayer. And if you, for me, if you think of it, the, what's remarkable about this, it's, it's, it's like for me always, the remarkable thing about the M50 is there's so few um, crashes. The remarkable thing, looking back over the history of Irish Catholicism, is the, there's been uh, very few collective um, religious experiences uh, outside of the institutional church. Um, but more recently, uh, I think, among Catholics, um, that this sense of spirituality is found in mindfulness, meditation, and yoga. Uh, and uh, I think that you know, kind of is beginning, we're getting a syncretic uh, form of Catholicism now. Um, Irish Catholics quickly learned uh, to become humble, chaste, uh, docile, and obedient. Um, non-compliance to teachings, rules and regulations, um, 
they, they could be forgiven. Um, but to resist or challenge institutionally um, form of uh, religious practice and belief was not tolerated. So, you know, it was, it was fine to be a sinner, but not to challenge the sin. Um, and this, this, the creation of these humble, chaste, docile, obedient, and I call them bodies, uh, we can call them souls, uh, or we can call them individuals, um, was, was central to the church gaining a monopoly, uh, not just over morality, but within uh, other institutional fields, particularly, obviously, education, family education, health and social welfare. But it was also, of course, uh, a major player in politics, the media, and at local level, in many voluntary organizations, um, and most notably the Catholic Church, or so the GAA. Um, and I think it's it's that sense for me of when you uh, you know, examine like what a village like Coot Hall would have been in the 1950s in, in McGarren's time. It was the way in, in which an institutional form of religion permeated you know, voluntary organizations, not just the GAA, but farmers, uh, local interest groups, um, uh, the parish priest would have been the, you know, the, the, the president, and then into every aspect uh, of, of, of social and cultural life. Um, and uh, so th this, very quickly, uh, it became a rigid hierarchical system uh, in which there was no room for resistance, challenge, debate, and discussion. The Catholic Church was the one true to religion, and bishops and priests were its guardians and, and, and guides. Um, uh, and it, 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 it's, um, you know, Liam Ryan used to say that the, the Catholic Church was, a, was, a, was a, a fungus grew over the, the pond of our social life and kept all light hidden from it, which is, again, a very brave uh, statement to make. Um, um, but in the heydays of the institution of religion, Ireland became, to my mind, a kind of monastery. And going back you know, to the discussion about um, uh, um, oh, uh, the, the Catholics, Brian Moore's Catholics, um, it, but it was uh, an island shut off from the Western modernization. And for me, what it was, was like it was deliberately created uh, uh, to keep the Irish pure and simple. Um, to allow no outside influences that would contaminate, and to paraphrase Archbishop McQuaid when talking about the Vatican, uh, Vatican II, he said, there's nothing in it that will trouble your tranquil minds, or tranquil minds. And that was the kind of attitude that, you know, that everything was, was, was um, uh, looked after uh, uh, for you. But some, from the 1960s, the walls of the monastery began to crumble under the relentless onslaught of the market, the media, and more uh, and later the Irish state. Um, so, if you will, there was an, an attempt um, you know, to put up the barriers, um, uh, but the, you know, the tide of, of Western culture was just relentless. So. Um, uh, there was, it was inevitable almost that the, you know, the, the institutional um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the walls, which had been there for so long, began to crumble. Um, and, and for me, the, the, you know, the, this was just accelerated by the cler cler clerical child sex abuse scandals. Um, and what has happened is, is that um, again, you know, Liam Ryan, when he was writing in the 1970s, said that, or maybe it was the early 80s, he said that the church uh, is no longer, um, you know, a, 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 a kind of an instrument, uh, uh, but rather that it has become the moral conscience of Irish society. And again, that res resonates back, you know, to one of the questions earlier. Um, I mean, can the church have an influence, not just on individuals, but on society? Um, and there's no longer the sacred canopy, this is to you know, paraphrase Peter Berger, under which all social life takes place. Because I, sometimes I think that, you know, 
the Catholic Church, I said, you know, there was a, was a kind of a, a fungus or that grew over the problem. But in other words, in many ways, it, 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 it was like some big umbrella that was hanging, uh, stood, held over the island of Ireland, protecting it from the, the, you know, the, the slings and arrows and reins of outrageous um, secularism. Um, uh, and so once it began to lose control of the religious field, it began to lose control over its members, who disregarded many of its teachings, particularly in relation to salvation and sexuality. Um, so the result is that religion has become more private and personal. Uh, collective belief is no longer sustained by collective practice. There is increased doubt, there's increased ambiguity and scepticism. Now maybe they were there before, and, and we don't know that because you know sur surveys and um, studies didn't get into that. But I, I, I think that it's now because it's, it's, it's more readily and easily shared that the ambiguity, skepticism and doubt have increased. Um, so the fundamental beliefs about the nature of God, the divinity of Christ, life after death, and the way to attain salvation are, are being questioned. Um, and at the same time, religion has become compartmentalized into specific times and places. There is a time and place to be religious, and most of these now revolve around family celebrations or times of trauma, suffering, and death. People no longer live in Catholic time and space. The religious, and I, just to say that, you know, I did spend some time in, in, in Glenstall, and of course that is Catholic time and space, because you, you go in and sing and pray six times a day, um, and that is, a great example of what Catholic time and space looks and feels like. But the religious calendar, feast days, novenas, missions, retreats, devotions, benedictions, in which I grew up and which most of, of, of my generation uh, have, are disappearing or have disappeared. And homes are no longer filled with crucifixes, statues, holy pictures and waterfronts. People no longer carry rosary beads or wear scapulars and medals. So if, if that's what I mean about it being ingrained uh, in, in body and soul. And uh, so the, the, the decline of the symbolic cap of the domination of the church has meant that there's no need to be a good Catholic anymore. Uh, there was a time when being a good Catholic was central, central to being successful, to achieving office, to doing business, to regulating family life. Um, and so it's no longer necessary to be a good Catholic to be honored and respected. There's no need to be blessed by bishops and priests. Being a good person has become separated from being a good Catholic. So the culture of self-denial has been replaced by a culture of self-fulfillment. Um, it's acceptable to be secular, sensuous, and self-expressive. Um, people are now able to be self-indulgent. They can immerse themselves in the material world. They can fill their pleasures and desires without fear of condemnation or damnation. And that's, for me, is, is, is the big one, is that uh, uh, you know, that regime uh, that the church instituted uh, was uh, a regime of fear. Slowly but surely, not only, but that, that it, it, for, for many people it, it was. Slowly but surely, the island of Catholic Ireland and saints and scholars um, which had been the beacon in, in the sea of secularity, became like the rest of the rest. Um, so the, I think that I'm not going to develop this. There are four, we can see when we look at you know, the, the Catholic people in Ireland, um, we, I, can, I'm, I, I keep, these keep on changing, but I, I, I still think there are four general types. So I'm generalizing again, but there is research that, that backs up this bit. Um, and the, you know, the first one is those, those legal um, orthodox, you know, traditional Catholics. Um, um, uh, they, these are mostly elderly and, uh, um, and, and they, they adhere to religion in which they were socialized. Um, so I want to talk about some people I met or interviewed in, in the meeting, Meetings of Life study I did 10 years ago. And Phil Durkin was a, was a 70 year old woman and when I asked her if she believed in God, her reply, and that was a question that came to me, do you believe in God? 
I, I do, yes. I go to Mass every Sunday and I say my prayers at night. Um, and that linking of God to going to Mass. And when I asked if she talked to God, she said, no, not really. I'm not really religious. I just say my prayers at night. And then I go to Mass on Sunday and I light my candles after Mass. And that's it. And so she she prayed to St. Rita, but she, she didn't know who St. Rita was or what she was the patron saint of. She had Lourdes medals, Sacred Heart Lamp, Statue of the Prague, Child of Prague, and a picture of, of the Twelve Apostles in, 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 her, in her apartment. Um, she'd been to Lourdes twice and was going to Fatima later uh, that year. She believes in miracles and the power of prayer, um, and, and that can create change. And she believes in heaven, thinks it's a happy place, she doesn't believe in hell. Um, now, the main, that, that it, from my mind, has become a minority. It was the dominant majority up until, um, uh, you know, I think the 60s and 70s. The main form of Catholic, from my mind, are, are cultural Catholics. And they, they don't have much interest in religion, but they are happy for the church to fulfill their needs when it comes to major transitions, such as birth, marriage, death, and illness and tragedy. Um, and again, uh, one of the persons they interviewed was Miley Nolan, and he, he goes to, to, to Mass and, and you know, his, his belief in God was reignited when his son died tragically young if, a couple of years previously. Um, uh, and he says he does go to Mass occasionally, but when he goes, uh, he prays for about 10 minutes. The rest of the time I'd be muddling through, my, through things in my mind thinking about work or home, or what we were doing after lunch. And again, you know, that going back to, you know, that going and sitting behind your father and, and never seeing him, his, his lips move in prayer. Um, and, you know, he doesn't have any sense of life after death, um, but more a, 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 a kind of a hope. Um, and then there are those Catholics who, uh, for me, um, are, they have become not only disinterested, but completely detached, and some of them are alienated and angry about the church. Um, and I think the, the, this number obviously is increasing uh, uh, rapidly. Um, uh, and I, 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 you know, I interviewed um, another one, Hannah Thompson, and she uh, is a committed atheist, but who, who goes to mass when she goes home. Um, and but she's able to say things like um, uh, God, yes, how crazy it is. I say God, I still say God a lot. How crazy is that? People kiss a piece of wood on Good Friday as part of a religious ceremony. So, you know, almost sacrilegious thought, um, but she's able to announce them in, in a way that I don't think would have been possible. Now, the one I wanted to concentrate on, and, and I'm, really, I'm conscious of, of finishing up right now, but the, is, is, the, is creative Catholics. And, and these are Catholics uh, that um, have gone and, 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 if you like, run with being religious within the institutional church or alternatively outside of the institutional church. But they, they have a, a religious appetite. They have a, a, a keen interest in religion. Now, um, uh, many of these are what Gladys Ganiel has called extra-institutional Catholics. And you know, they, they come together and we can find them in many parishes. Um, and they, they are, in, in many respects, the lifeblood of the church because they're, they're questioning, they're challenging. Um, and in, in many ways, they're, uh, they're kind of almost seizing control of their own church. But then there, there, there was one other woman, and that was the other thing is, so many of the, of the people who had left the church and, and to, that they weren't spiritually um, searching. Uh, whereas this woman I interviewed, Joan Gallagher, um, she was brought up as a Catholic. She's married to two kids and she gets together um, with her friends about once a month. And she says, we start by invoking the spirits, north, south, east and west. And then we might go from there into drumming and movement or movement on its own and chanting. So it's quite a natural flow of what comes out. Um, and then the Celtic festivals, we would mark these with extra, extra like sounds. We'd celebrate Bridget in February. We'd go out and, uh, and for some of the festivals, like the solstices. And it's this you know, um, reimagining and re, 
in, if you like, re-embodying um, uh, Catholic and making it your own, uh, which, which interests me. But the thing is, I didn't find very many of these people, and, and I'm not sure to what extent the extra in, or the extra institutional Catholics that Gagnon talks about are are are, are that numerous. Um, and so I, my thing is, is that, as I've said, that, that for generations, Catholics were isolated, cocooned, and infantilized. They were spoon-fed their religion. They weren't encouraged to think for themselves, to read, discuss, experience, challenge, and explore. Our alternative ways of being spiritual, of, of relating to the supernatural and transcendental, dental, were discouraged. Um, and so for me, um, uh, the, going back to uh, John Paul Gallagher, the, the Jesuit, uh, who was in UCD when I started, and he said to me, the Catholic, Catholic, Catholicism in Ireland is like an egg. It's got a, a rock hard shell, but once it's cracked, there's no yolk to sustain it. Um, and so when Irish Catholics stop being Catholic, they stop being religious. And I think that's what the, the key thing is when we look back over the last 50 years, what happened? For me, the reality is that the religious baby was thrown out with the Catholic bathwater. Um, so I, I go back to McGarren myself, um, and I and I realise that you know um, uh, uh, when McGarren said he wasn't religious, I think he is an incredibly religious writer. And there was a discussion earlier about uh, authors. Um, but it, it resonates for me in, in, a, in a kind of um, pantheistic, naturalistic, uh, but he doesn't ever make it into a theology, let alone explain it. But he lived it and it resonates in his work. And so therefore I find uh, solace and comfort uh, in going back um, uh, and, 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 and reading what he put in, puts into words that I find uh, very difficult to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. That was